I'm Dr. Katherine Buford, and welcome to tonight's webinar. I'm the new media director for Mensa Medical, and I'm very excited to share tonight's presentation titled Rethink Alzheimer's. This is an interactive webinar on recent studies for drug-free treatment and prevention. And tonight, Dr. Mensa will be speaking with you, as you know, a little bit about his background. Dr. Mensa is board certified in integrative pediatrics. He's treated more than 10,000 patients with advanced targeted nutrient therapy, which he will discuss some more tonight. He also serves on the board at Walsh Research Institute and is clinical instructor for Walsh Research Institute's international doctor training programs around the world. As an undergraduate, he studied at Northwestern University, and he holds a medical degree from Finch University of Health Sciences, also known as Chicago Medical School. He, he completed his residency in family medicine at Swedish Covenant Hospital, and he co-founded Mensa Medical in 2008 with Dr. Judith Bowman. Tonight, what we're really here to do is to really talk about Alzheimer's and its myths, its misconceptions, some do's and some don'ts. Um, we're here to talk about addressing really Alzheimer's from a biochemical perspective. What we want to do is we want to rethink Alzheimer's from many different perspectives. We want to rethink prescription medication. We want to rethink causes. We want to rethink the age at which Alzheimer's begins. We also call that the age of onset. We want to rethink family support because this condition is actually a condition that affects the entire family. We want to rethink symptoms. We want to rethink healthcare. Let's consider our approach. This is a great quote. It's a mind that is overcome by Alzheimer's. This comes from a loved one of an Alzheimer's patient sharing what she wishes people knew about the disease. About Mensa Medical. We're providing a drug-free molecular approach to healing using advanced nutrient therapy protocols. Each prescription is composed of specific vitamins, minerals, and amino acid compounds. There's a unique design to address individual chemical imbalances. Nutrients are used at therapeutic levels, which means that the dosages are typically several times higher than the recommended daily allowance. So folks, this is not nutrition. This is molecular medicine. Don't do this at home by yourself. We've successfully treated several thousand patients with various conditions. Conditions such as Alzheimer's, ADHD, anorexia, autism, bipolar disorder, bulimia, depression, learning disorders, OCD, schizophrenia, and many others. What is Alzheimer's and perhaps from a molecular level? First of all, Alzheimer's is characterized by severe oxidative stress. That is what we call really cellular rust. We see these little tiny uh, conditions we call amyloid plaques and also neurofibrillary tangles. There's typically a disorder of what we call metal metabolism. In other words, we might have high levels of certain toxic metals like copper or mercury, or we might have very low levels of some very beneficial metals like zinc. We often see elevated toxic metals, but very key in Alzheimer's specifically, we see low levels of a protein in the brain called metallothionine. The state of Alzheimer's. The incidence of Alzheimer's will grow from 5 million Americans today to 16 million Americans by the year 2050 growing numbers in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s will develop Alzheimer's. There are steps you can take now to minimize your risk or live well with Alzheimer's. Let's look at some of the different theories that came about over time with regard to Alzheimer's. The first one was the loss of acetylcholine activity. Now this is very interesting because it was believed that acetylcholine, or ACH as we abbreviate it, um, which is a neurotransmitter, a chemical that is actually used to help move
move signals from one nerve cell to another nerve cell, that this particular chemical is actually low in individuals with Alzheimer's. Now what happened was that that theory panned out not to be quite so true because when they dealt with the low concentrations, it didn't help the disorder. People continued to get worse. But what did come out of that theory very positively were medications like Namenda or Aricept, which are based upon helping to increase acetylcholine and what we call the, the receptor site or the cleft. However, the problem is you, the disorder still continues to go downhill even though the medication is being used. I'm not saying don't use these meds. They often help people to sort of move through the condition a little bit better, but it doesn't actually treat the disorder. Then there were the concepts of the amyloid plaque and the tau proteins. Now, amyloid plaques are proteins that sort of accumulate structurally in the brain. You can actually see them uh, during certain testing patterns. Tau proteins are, are similar in that they are protein uh, issues that have to do with transport mechanisms for nutrients, for structural proteins, and a variety of other things. And it was theorized that either one of these conditions were the key to this process. It turns out not to yet really be proven in either direction. Then there's the inflammation theory. That was very interesting because Individuals have noted over time that when their significant ones who were elderly um, had severe illness or fevers or flus or infections, their memories actually cleared up. And so it was thought that inflammation might be the key to really treating Alzheimer's. And we still think there is a bit of truth to that. But we also now look at the oxidative stress model. Now, this is very key because the oxidative stress model really goes to address almost all the major issues of Alzheimer's. What's more, we note that when we treat oxidative stress as well as inflammation in these individuals, we see tremendous gains in literally halting or shifting the progression of the disorder in individuals who have mild to moderate degrees of Alzheimer's. Then there's the toxic metal um, thought or consideration in and of itself, removing toxic metals does not change the course of the disease, excuse me, the disorder. Epigenetics, very, very key. Now we're talking about the environment affecting the condition genetically, or shall we say genetic expression of a given condition. Very, very key, still under active investigation. Now, glial cell dysfunction. Glial cells are very interesting creatures. Every nerve cell in our brain has an associated three to four cells that are there to purely treat, support, protect, and provide nutrients to that one nerve cell. We call them nerve cells or glial cells. They are very well close to blood vessels and they absorb nutrients and other activators and agents and they transport them to the nerve cell. Now, this particular theory is really geared towards the understanding that if we actually damage the, the glial cells or the support system for a given nerve, that nerve suffers and then dies. And this is really part of the latest and most exciting pieces of research that is out there with regard to Alzheimer's. And it holds a great deal of validity. So let's talk about addressing Alzheimer's biochemically. Here we've got a wonderful slide that talks about free radicals and free radical damage and the role of oxidative stress. So if we look at our, uh, our slide here, we see the sun, and there that references ultraviolet rays. We see the car, which references atmospheric pollution. We see little fellow there with stress and poor diet. Each one of these elements lead to free radicals. Now, that's not the 1960s group known as the free radicals. It's actually what we call an unpaired group of electrons. So, like most things in our culture and society and in nature, when we are a pair, 
we tend to do sometimes a little bit better, whether that's, whether that's with friends or family or significant others. But alone, we're kind of free to do what we want, and some people unleashed are free to cause trouble. You might say they engage in radical behavior. So a free radical is actually an unpaired electron that can cause damage at the cellular level. Now, on the other half, or the other side of this slide, we see this thickened area to the very far right of the cell membrane, where it says protected by antioxidants. What we're looking at here is what the idea is to do to every single cell, which is to protect it, to give it strength, to give it um, capacity to prevent damage to that cell from the outside world. So on the left-hand side, we see at the bottom here a damaged cellular membrane, and you see how thin it is, versus a normal membrane, which is rather thick and well-protected. Free radical damage basically causes cellular rust, which this side, the left side of, this, of the slide kind of depicts here. We see that the cellular membrane is much thinner. We see these free radicals penetrating and creating discord in the membrane. Folks, what's very important is that the role of the cellular membrane is to protect the inside of the cell from the outside world. It also allows function of the cell to occur quite normally. When we have these free radicals that come in, they literally punch little holes in the cell wall. They thin the membrane, they stress out the cell. Anything stressed out can't really work too terribly well. When we talk about Alzheimer's, and we look at this biochemically, we often see that low levels of both metallothionine and glutathione, or protector proteins, are very much a key part of the discussion. We also see chronic inflammation and brain cell destruction. There's a very strong correlation between oxidative damage that's found on the autism spectrum and Alzheimer's disease. In fact, by applying autistic, excuse me, by applying um, the antioxidant therapy that's used to treat autism to patients in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease or dementia, we've seen tremendously powerful results. What we do with these theories is that we provide strong antioxidant potential to the damaged cell. So in this slide, we see here that we basically take one of these little spheres, which we call an electron, and if you remember from the previous slide, the unpaired electron, that's a free radical that's available to cause trouble, we now pair the two. And when we pair them, we create stability at a molecular level. What this means is that now, instead of having free radical damage, we've got protection from free radical damage. Metallothionine is a protein that protects the brain from metals and from free radicals. Um, many medical, excuse me, many metal ions include iron, copper, and zinc, and they can enhance the formation of what we call amyloid plaques in the brain. Autopsy studies show that metallothionine levels tend to be less than a third of normal concentrations in Alzheimer's brains, as compared to the metallothionine levels in other elderly individuals. Metallothionine promotion therapy is what we use to overcome brain oxidative stress and inflammation and help to repair the blood-brain barrier. It's also key to the formulation of nutrients that promote the production and functioning of metallothionine. Typically speaking, we need to make sure you've got enough zinc on board. We call that zinc loading. And then we're able to initiate metallothionine promotion. The evidence. Research and clinical outcomes suggest that we can actually shift the course of the disorder itself and hinder the progression to either mild or moderate Alzheimer's patients. Outcome studies have shown partial improvement of memory, followed by stabilization of the condition. 
85% of patients have shown no further progression of Alzheimer's after several years of treatment. Of course, more research is necessary to ensure and better measure efficacy. So how can we rethink Alzheimer's? First of all, we have to rethink causes. We have to rethink the onset of age. We have to rethink family support, symptoms, prescription medication, and healthcare in and of itself. Let's talk about the cause. Alzheimer's doesn't just happen. Like really most diseases or disorders in the human body and the human mind, there's a role of lifetime stressors as well as genetic predispositions. It could be smoking, it could be poor diet, it could be lack of exercise, it could be a plethora of things, many environmental, but here's what's key. Most of us don't realize that environmental situations can trigger genetic responses. So there's genetic predisposition and environmental stressors that come together that can certainly influence the development of Alzheimer's. Risk factors. Age, head injury, educational level, mental and physical activity, vascular factors, alcohol abuse, toxic metals, and poor nutrition are all very strong risk factors for Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's doesn't simply affect elderly individuals. Sometimes it can occur as early as age of 40. Symptoms. What's very important is that we often miss, especially in our senior populations, that Alzheimer's symptoms can actually mimic depression. And we may think that individuals are just kind of sitting there and, and they're, they're depressed for no reason and they can't snap out of it, when in actuality we might be seeing the early signs of Alzheimer's itself. We have to rethink the use and the role of prescription medication. In certain situations, prescription medication can actually make Alzheimer's symptoms worse. Let's rethink healthcare. Physicians really need to ask the question of patients, who are you biochemically? Not that they expect a response, but that's the investigation process that really needs to be undertaken on our side, the practitioner side of things. With this information, we can individualize diet and nutrient therapy to achieve improved emotional states. We can foster better behavioral stability. We can decrease anxiety, reduce depression, and stave off further progression of the disease by environmental factors. Consider our approach. Our nutrient therapy protocols work to stabilize mental processing and emotional states, foster better behavioral stability, decrease anxiety, and reduce depression in the treatment of Alzheimer's patients and may help to prevent the onset in other family members. Contact us to see how you or a loved one can become a patient. For information about Mensa Medical and its antioxidant therapy for Alzheimer's disease, please contact Mensa Medical at telephone number 630-256-8308. You can also email us at nurse at mensamedical.com. You can meet us in Arizona, December 6th and 7th. Our main clinic is in Warrenville, Illinois. Visit our website to learn more about regional outreach clinics near you. Now it's time for questions. All right. So we had some technical difficulties with the previous webinar, which I apologize for. So these questions that Dr. Mensa will now ask are actually the most common questions that we received from the actual live webinar that we hosted. So I'll start with a question from Robert. He asks, are you basically saying that Alzheimer's is mainly caused by inflammation? Well, inflammation is certainly a key factor in the development of Alzheimer's. What is very, very important is the concept of oxidative stress, and they tend to go hand in hand. Inflammation tends to lead to oxidative stress, and oxidative stress leads to inflammation. 
inflammation is the key element that truly moves through almost every single negative condition that affects the human body and the human brain. Inflammation is key because it unleashes a host of chemical factors that can, in excess, produce more difficulty and challenges. So, yes, inflammation is a key piece that we need to be concerned about and fight against in the struggle against Alzheimer's disease. Miriam asks, is there a correlation between Alzheimer's and a certain methylation type? That's a great question. Um, in general, anyone can develop Alzheimer's at, with any particular type of methylation, whether they're under-methylated, normally methylating, or even over-methylating. However, we do tend to see a greater preponderance of individuals with under-methylation that develop Alzheimer's disease. Chris asks, I have a daughter whose grandmother had Alzheimer's. She's now a teenager. Are there any preventative measures I can take now to help protect her from the disease? That's a great question. And as we kind of looked at earlier in earlier slides, we have to take a look at lifestyle. Lifestyle plays a huge role. I want everyone to consider the concept of what I call biochemical armor. Let's say we're all born with a certain powerful armor. It almost sounds like Dungeons and Dragons, I apologize. But if we all have a certain armor that is pre-programmed to withstand a certain number of insults over the course of our lives, then the more insults we have, the more rapidly we have them, the more susceptible we're going to be to almost any disease or condition. So let's say you have the capacity for 500,000 hits. Now, if you had lead a fairly decent life with decent nutrition, decent exercise, minimize stress, minimize external uh, exposure factors, you know, you might not ever see a condition or a distressful disorder in your lifetime. There are many people who, and this is a very, very small group, who tend to lead horrific lives, and while they seem to age rapidly, they may tend to live very long lives, and, and who knows what their armor is like. It must be very powerful. But for most of us, the more we tend to expose ourselves or, or be exposed to insulting energies, whether it's uh, a very crowded metropolitan city full of fumes, full of gases, uh, a ridiculously bad diet like, well, let's just say it, the typical American diet. It is horrific. Or an environment full of metals, uh, of toxins, or toxic elements, pollutants. Each one of these plays a synergistic role relative to the other in the development of any disease or disorder. Diabetes, hypertension, both of them affect vasculature, that same vasculature which delivers our blood, our nutrients, those vital elements that every cell in our body needs to survive. Now remember when we were talking about the glial cells, the glial cells have their little tentacles out there wrapped around blood vessels so that they can absorb those nutrients and bring them over to the nerve cell in the brain. Okay, So now anything that affects how the blood vessel works is going to complicate and increase risk factors for Alzheimer's. So when individuals have diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, all those elements change what we call compliance, that is the elasticity, the capacity of a blood vessel to do its job and deliver nutrients throughout the body. So managing our risk factors are going to be very, very important pieces for preventative medicine in terms of preventing, staving off, or delaying the onset of Alzheimer's. Tom asks, regarding the slide on risk factors, in what ways is educational level a risk factor for Alzheimer's? Well, we tend to note that individuals who are higher educated tend to have, or shall we say who have engaged in more schooling, tend to have a lower risk factor for the development of Alzheimer's. Um, the idea here is, I guess, you either use it or you lose it, as they say. Um, so when we talk about 
looking to read a book or study a new language or, or keep your mind flowing and active, that activity level seems to have a protective variable here or, to or a protective piece in the development of Alzheimer's. Um, yet at the same time, Alzheimer's does not discriminate by way of academic achievement. Anyone at any time period in life with regard to educational level can certainly develop Alzheimer's. This question comes from Twitter. Anita asks, do you use chelation with NT promotion therapy? We never use chelation. We are very much opposed to the concept of chelation because what happens with chelation is that you take and strip the body, not just of bad metals, but of many good metals. Calcium is a metal. Magnesium is a metal. Zinc, a very, very important metal. Chelation strips you immediately, and many practitioners will say, hey, I'm going to put back the good nutrients in while we take the bad ones out. Well, if you've ever really done this and studied the process, it takes sometimes months to get back to a normal level, elements like zinc. To get it to a functional level, an optimal level, it takes even longer. In the meantime, all of your physiologic processes, cognitive and corporal, that rely on zinc, for example, or calcium, are not able to function properly. Many people crash when they undergo chelation. Okay? So we do not chelate. What we do is we regulate. And regulation is different. What regulation does is that it puts into more accurate proportions different metals in the system. So if you have too little of one metal, we increase it. If you have too much of a given metal, we decrease it. And so we don't throw off what is called homeostasis or balance in your system. We modify it so that balance is reachieved. Crystal asks, do you treat Parkinson's disease? That's a great question. Um, we do actually treat Parkinson's disease, but I, I have a, a caveat about this. I always am, am cautious because we don't have the same kind of success rate with Parkinson's as we do with Alzheimer's. But what does that really mean? It means that literally 25% of people have the disorder stopped. They don't get worse. They, they kind of hang out where they are or they improve. Now, that doesn't sound like a very high proportion. But one day I was sitting around and I heard somebody talking about the lottery. And I said, what a concept. You know, you're, you're spending your money on something that has ridiculous odds and it doesn't make any sense to me. But then there was a strange trigger that went through my mind and I said, now, wait a minute. If somebody told me that in one of four rooms in a building, there was a billion dollars. And I thought somebody would say to me, well, would you go check out one of those four rooms? And I said, you know what? Of course I would. A billion dollars? Absolutely. One in four chance? Definitely. But then I realized those were the odds we're actually talking about with regard to Parkinson's. So I began to look at it as, well, now we don't have a real medical treatment for Parkinson's in the traditional world. But if we have a one in four chance of actually stopping the progression of the disorder, it's worth talking about and doing. The interesting thing is that even if we're not able to stop the progression of the disorder in that one in four, that, that three in four population, three out of those four individuals can actually have 60% of the symptoms of Parkinson's resolve. Now, folks, one of my favorite actors is um, Mr. Fox. Uh, not Jamie Fox, but Michael J. Fox. Uh, of course, I do like Jamie Foxx, too, but that's neither here nor there. Michael J. Fox made me laugh for such a long time growing up. And I often thought if I could reach out to him and say, Mr. Fox, let us try this therapy with you. If Michael J. Fox could get back his, capa his capacity to act without hindrance, if we could stop the tremors in his hands, he would be so much happier in his life, even if his Parkinson's continued. He'd still be able to act, 
he'd enjoy that lifelong gift that he was given, and as a gift to us, we would once again not be shortchanged by the lack or the loss of such a talented individual in the performance field. So there are many positives to the therapy, even if we can't stop the progression of the disorder, we can certainly help to minimize many of the signs and symptoms of Parkinson's. Harold asks, are there certain foods you can eat to increase methylthionine protein? No, this is not a, um, a food issue or, or a dietary issue. You cannot eat enough food to produce biochemical balance when you are dysregulated. Foods can indeed exacerbate a condition, but in these particular states that we're talking about, diet is not going to fix the issue. It would require an extremely concentrated diet that no human being could possibly eat. It's like that commercial, you'd have to eat 30 bowls of total cereal three times a day to get the number of zinc molecules in this one capsule. This is why we call it nutrient power, and this is why we call it molecular medicine. It's not about diet. But diet can actually aggravate many conditions. So eating the wrong foods can certainly lead you to an exacerbation pathway. John asks, why is Alzheimer's more prevalent amongst women? That's actually a very interesting question. And while I know those statistics exist, the interesting thing is that when we see Alzheimer's patients, I can tell you that the predominance have been men. And so that's a very interesting statistic, but I'm not so sure I truly agree with it. Both sexes can be affected, but for the most part in our clinic and even in traditional medicine, when we are working in traditional medicine, the vast majority of individuals who presented to us were males. Rhonda asks, what causes glial cell damage? That's a great question. And anything from oxidative stress to vascular incapacitation is going to be key in damaging glial cells. It's a, a, a beautiful question. And the idea here, once again, to refresh folks is that glial cells support brain nerve cells. So if glial cells get damaged, nerve cells basically get hindered and die. <clears throat> Arthur asks, can you give an example of how prescription medication can actually make Alzheimer's symptoms worse? One of the many individuals don't just have Alzheimer's. So for example, we talked about depression as being one of the early signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. So now, a loved one who perhaps is actually overmethylated and they don't know their, their biochemical status now gets an antidepressant medication because their symptoms seem to look like depression. And what happens is that that person biochemically responds negatively to that medication because they're actually overmethylated and overmethylated individuals don't do well with many of the typical, excuse me, the atypical or the typical SSRIs or antipsychotic medications. <laughs> now, as a result, they actually decline faster based upon those medications that were given that were sort of contrary to their individual chemistries. So we see that medication can be damaging or can produce worsening symptomatologies um, in almost sort of an indirect fashion. Um, other medications can have direct effect in terms of producing inflammation, in terms of producing an increase in cholesterol levels that therefore includes any, uh, that affect vascular issues and so can really sort of minimize or weaken the delivery of nutrients to glial cells and therefore to brain cells. There's actually a very wide spectrum of challenges that medications cause that can worsen the Alzheimer's condition, if not directly, indirectly. And this is the last question before we wrap up. Amanda asks, how can we get in touch with you? Well, that's probably the easiest question to answer. Um, you can contact us by telephone at telephone number 
1-800-273-8308. Or you can send us an email at nurse at mensamedical.com or go to our website and figure out who you'd like to talk to, whether it's our product specialist, whether you want to leave a message for our uh, operations manager, or talk to one of our nurses. Um, we are absolutely available and here to service you, and answering questions is actually free. There's no charge for that.